Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, folks. I am really excited to meet you today. First, I want to thank Kurt for this very kind invitation to speak to you. I'm excited about sharing a few memories of the time that I spent with NASA and to facilitate my not getting things too wrong. I'll go through a series of slides that hopefully will remind some of you who were uh, watching this back then of what NASA was attempting to accomplish quite a number of years ago. Get a little closer. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, to start this off though, I think uh, my speech today was sort of labeled a race to the moon, so we're racing the Soviet Union. It's a bit more than a race because we weren't terribly good friends with the Soviets following the conclusion of World War II, as some of you are probably aware, living in that time era. Uh, just a couple of things to remind you really what was going on back in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Uh, as I said, our honeymoon with Russia broke up pretty quickly at the conclusion of World War II. Uh, just a few years after that, Russia exploded their first atomic weapon. Then, of course, you'll recall that uh, we were engaged in a proxy war, honestly, with communist China and Russia in the beginning of the 1950s in the Korean Peninsula. And then uh, in 1954, again, just a year or so after that war, Russia ex <clears throat> exploded their first thermonuclear weapon. So it was clear, I think, to the American people that uh, these were not going to be long-term friends of ours, especially at that point in time of history, because we were frankly concerned that they were developing military technology that could ultimately threaten us. If you happen to be listening to the radio in 1957 on a Friday afternoon about uh, 1 o'clock in Colorado, uh, whatever, you, whatever program you were listening to was interrupted by this really annoying beeping sound. Uh, it was broadcast pretty much uh, on every station throughout the world because it represented Russia's entry into space, the first uh, artificial satellite that circled the Earth. You can see from the statistics up here, not terribly impressive as a satellite by today's standards, relatively small device, only contained a radio transmitter that transmitted that beeping sound. Fortunately, the batteries played out pretty quickly and that stopped. And then it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere shortly thereafter because it was in a very low Earth orbit. Again, the first artificial satellite. Well, the American people were a bit concerned because that clearly represented a technological advance on their part that the United States hadn't shown a lot of interest in frankly, wasn't very advanced in that particular area. Uh, our, after breathing a sigh of relief, though, we quickly moved forward one month later to Sputnik 2, the second artificial satellite. And the impressive thing here is that the Russians have been planning this for some time. They actually carried a small dog up as a payload. Now, of course, they had no capability of actually returning anything from Earth orbit safely. So their plan had always been that the dog hopefully would survive about 10 days and they would learn more about how an organism, at that point a dog, later perhaps a human, a cosmonaut, might be able to survive in the space environment. But as you can see, space is not a very friendly environment for living in or existing in because the cabin temperatures rose, rose dramatically and the dog died only after a few hours of launch. Nonetheless, it was a pretty impressive accomplishment on the part of Russia. You can imagine our President Dwight Eisenhower at the time was a bit alarmed that uh, we weren't showing up as being very technically advanced in the world. So he reached out to the military and said, who can help me? We need to demonstrate that we do have an ongoing program, and perhaps, you know, we, we're not too threatened by the Russians. I'd like to show you a short video clip next. This one does not have any audio, but I think you'll be able to see uh, what's actually occurring. The Navy 
had developed a small artificial satellite that they hoped to put up the next year as a part of the International Geophysical Year activities. So let's watch this, and I'll give you an impression of how advanced we were at that point. Again, this is a launch from Cape Canaveral. Very short clip, but again, pretty representative of what's going on then. And the satellite was located about a half mile from the launch pad. It had been, uh, the, obviously the rocket exploded on ignition, so it uh, blew the satellite some distance away, nowhere close to Earth orbit. Well, President Eisenhower was not impressed. Uh, he reached out to the Army. We had some captured uh, World War II scientists, including Werner von Braun, that had been brought to the United States working in Alabama with the military there. They also were developing some launch systems and had a small satellite that they wanted to attempt to launch. So let's move forward. This will be a night launch from Cape Canaveral. This one has a little audio, so we'll join the countdown in about T minus two. Finally, we have a successful launch. Actually, again, not a very impressive satellite, something about the size of a really large grapefruit. Uh, had some scientific instruments on it that continued to respond for a period of months. So finally, we are in space. Uh, President Eisenhower at that point in early 1958 created a national agency called the National Aeronautics and Space Administration that I ultimately went to work for a few years later. I say reluctantly because President Eisenhower was always nervous from his experiences as commander in World War II and the advancement of the military, con uh, the military group here in the United States uh, allied with industry in the early 1950s. So it was a rather small agency to oversee the civilian development of United States interest in space. One of the first activities, of course, was to see if we might be able to uh, begin preparing for sending uh, perhaps a human being into orbit. That would really be an impressive task. I've just highlighted here a few of the activities that NASA was involved in very early in the uh, advent of NASA. You can see being an animal, especially a chimpanzee back then, was not a very favorable occupation. Many. <laughs> Many of the uh, flights were not successful, sadly, but we did learn a lot, again, emphasizing the really dangerous aspects, the environment of trying to live and operate in space that exists still today. Uh, we did label them monkey knots. Uh, Ham, perhaps the most famous one, after a successful launch, declared that he would not fly again by some visual antics, and he was promptly retired and did survive to 27 years old retirement out at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, obviously, our interest ultimately, though, is to send a human into space. And for that reason, NASA says, let's go select uh, some astronauts. We'll start training them in the hopes that we can eventually fly them into orbit. You're looking here at the first group selected, a total of seven military guys. Uh, I see a couple of young people out here, so I always like to explore whether there would have been any interest. And in fact, many of you would have been eligible, perhaps at that point in the late 1950s, if you were interested in flying into space. So let's see if you met the five rigorous criteria that NASA had. Number one, you couldn't be older than 39. A few of you may be excluded, but perhaps back then you were eligible. Okay, we didn't want to fly older guys into orbit like me because of complications. Number two, you couldn't be taller than five foot 11 inches. So I see a couple of young folks here on the front that certainly meet that criteria. Our spacecraft were really tiny. So we couldn't accommodate tall guys or women for that matter. 
Third, and sadly for me, you had to have really good eyesight. No glasses, no contact lenses. There were no ophthalmologists available to help you out in orbit. The last two requirements when I present at high school settings are difficult for the kids to achieve because you needed an engineering or hard science degree from a college or university. Our spacecraft were difficult to operate back then for sure, so it was necessary that the pilots have some considerable capability. And the fifth requirement is the explanation for why you see no ladies up here. You needed to have a minimum of 1,500 hours piloting a jet aircraft. And the only opportunity to achieve that particular background would have been in the military. So that's why at the time only men who had been pilots either for the Navy or the Air Force fell into that selection criteria. Uh, well, the, ro the world is rocking along. Uh, we are sort of in a conflict with Russia, not an open conflict in the early 1960s. We have a new president, John F. Kennedy. He has experienced some difficulties with the Russians. You know, they had shot down Gary Powers in our U-2 spy plane. Also, we just had an abortive uh, attempt to displace Castro in Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. So he was looking for some opportunity to show that the United States was still a vital player in the world history. So sadly, Russia pulls another first. They fly a cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, into orbit. He only makes one trip around the Earth, but that's impressive enough. Also, they had not refined their capability of getting folks back. So shortly uh, after he deorbited uh, down around 30,000 feet, he opened the hatch, jumped out, and then actually flew to the ground on his parachute. Nothing uh, high tech, but still a very, very impressive maneuver. Well, uh, President Kennedy again reached out and said, NASA, you've been in business for a few years. What can you do to help me? Our response was, frankly, we aren't able to put anyone in space right now. We can do a suborbital flight. We might be able to take one of the astronauts and send them up on a short trajectory, maybe 15 minutes suborbital. He said, do anything you can because we're in, we're in deep trouble with the Russians, at least from a PR standpoint. This next slide you can see in the Oval Office in the lower right. President Kennedy and his wife, along with Vice President Johnson, are watching the launch at Cape Canaveral on a little black and white TV because that represented the technology that we had available to us today. Alan Shepard, of course, was the astronaut for that mission, and it was highly successful. We recovered him uh, after a very short duration flight in the Atlantic Ocean. President Kennedy, based on that remarkable accomplishment, goes to, to Congress a month later. I'd like for you to watch this really short clip because it's a segment of his address to Congress. He challenges NASA for three things. So I asked my high school kids, see if you can spot the three challenges in his address. It's very short. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So the three challenges were what? Send a man to the moon, do it pretty quickly before the end of the decade. This is 1961, so that would be before the beginning of 1970. NASA has about eight years to pull this off. We still haven't even put a person in Earth orbit. Okay, and the most critical challenge was the third one. Did anyone pick up the fact that once we send someone to the moon, it would be helpful if we brought them back safely? That's the hard part of the journey. NASA immediately embarked on a program, a three-segment pro, three program, the first called Mercury, which was a single passenger uh, spacecraft. 
You can see here we had a total of seven astronauts. Only six were eligible medically to fly at that time. And their missions are relatively short missions, but nonetheless progressing toward learning how man might survive in space. The next program, Gemini, Gemini is a Greek word for twin. So here we're dealing with two astronauts, a somewhat larger spacecraft, but still incredibly cramped. Uh, in the spacecraft at that point in time, astronauts launched on their back on a contoured couch to absorb the G-forces from launch. And these two guys were so close together, their shoulders were actually touching each other. You can see for the final mission, that's quite a long time to spend in close proximity to your best buddy. So they were up there uh, for considerable length of time. But again, very, very cramped quarters. Finally, we're to the uh, best part of the program, Apollo. I joined the agency in 1965 at the beginning of Gemini, and so was intimately involved in the development of the spacecraft and uh, astronaut activities for Apollo. Apollo is a three-man crew, much, much bigger. <clears throat> in Apollo, they were actually able to get out of their launch couch, fold it up like a camping couch, stow it over in a tiny corner, and able to float around a distance of maybe three feet or four feet at the most. So again, extremely close quarters. The mission consisted of launching into Earth orbit. At that point, we would transfer them to the moon and go into a lunar orbit. There was a tiny spacecraft called a lunar module that was attached to the stack. Two, only two of the three astronauts would then climb through a tunnel, enter the lunar module, fly down to the lunar surface, get out, do their activities, launch from the lunar surface back up to meet with their third companion, who's been patiently circling around the moon waiting on them. Then they would fly back to Earth, uh, splash down in the Pacific Ocean, and be picked up by a Navy aircraft carrier. At least that's the mission sequence we anticipated. Uh, you can see the big elements of the program here. The command module in the lower left is where the astronauts lived in transit. The uh, command service module in the upper right it has that attached to a large engine that will transfer them to the moon and bring them back to Earth. And finally, the spider-looking device in the lower right is the lunar module that they'll use to descend and come back up from the lunar surface. Sadly, the first crew, Apollo 1, in training for ultimately a launch, died in a fire inside the capsule during a ground test at Kennedy Space Center at that time. Due to an electrical fault, <clears throat> a wiring uh, caught fire, the hatch was not easily removed, and the astronauts all died from smoke inhalation. A real question at that point in the program whether the agency or the programs would even survive. NASA fought back really hard, and two years later, we are back into attempting to get some guys into orbit. You'll see a group of flights here, a remarkably short list, actually, for uh, the challenge that lay in front of us. A series of three unmanned flights, and then finally, for what I would call rehearsal flights to try to get us to the moon and back safely. Apollo 8, I like to emphasize that was called our Christmas mission. Uh, we actually had three uh, devoted Christians on that particular flight, an unusual occurrence for NASA at that time among the astronauts. Sadly, no Methodists though, there was an Episcopalian, <laughs> a Catholic, and uh, I believe a Presbyterian. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the mission was unique in that we launched over the Christmas period, something that NASA always avoided. This time, the alignment was such that it was critical that we do the mission then. The mission had been pulled forward because it, we saw that our deadline for getting to the moon before the end of 1969 was fast approaching. Frank Borman was the uh, commander on that particular mission. And uh, was extremely successful. On Christmas Eve, he and his two crew members read the um, passage from Genesis, which was really remarkable. If you happen to have been alive and watching TV at the time, it was a very memorable occurrence. 
in NASA's programs. Okay, let's jump forward to Apollo 11. We're uh, about six months before President Kennedy's deadline. The crew consists of three members, of course. Uh, you'll all be familiar with their names, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin. Because of age, Mr. Aldrin is the only one still surviving at this point in time. Launch picture on the right. Beautiful launch, absolutely no problem with the transfer to the lunar orbit. Uh, this next video clip I find very interesting because you have the privilege of looking out one of the windows. There were two small triangular shaped windows in the lunar module as the two crew members, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin, are descending down to lunar surface. So you'll be able to experience the same thing they saw. Uh, please keep in mind the three things noted on the bottom of the screen. See if you can pick that up in the audio. Most of the audio is uh, Mr. Aldrin, who's communicating all of the results of the gauges, pressures, time, distance, orientation, all sorts of things to prevent uh, Mr. Armstrong from having to distract from looking out the window where he's trying to fly to and reading all of these instruments. So he's just reading that data out loud uh, to assist uh, the pilot, uh, Mr. Armstrong. But again, listen for the three events down on the bottom, if you will. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same type. We're go. Altitude 1600. Eagle looking great. Roger 1202. We copy it. Three by degrees. 750. Coming down to 23. 540 feet down to 15. 1050 feet down at 4. Altitude velocity light. Three and a half down, 220 feet. Eleven forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet. Four and a half down, five and a half down. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. 875 feet, guys looking good, down a half. Six forward. 60 seconds. Lights on, forward. Forward, 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Fake shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, drift. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Again, if you were listening to the audio, you heard 1202. That was NASA's code number for a particular failure of the, of the uh, computer, landing computer. At that point in time, Mr. Armstrong had to take over full physical landing of the spacecraft or the lunar module. Uh, primarily because uh, so much data was coming back from the landing radar that the computer just shut down and overload. Fortunately, Mr. Armstrong was probably one of the best pilots that our country had at that time and fully capable of carrying out the mission. However, as he approached the planned landing site, it was clear that our projections of a nice clean landing pad were not true. There were large boulders in the field. It was on the edge of a crater. He made the real time decision to say this is not gonna be a good landing. So I need to find a better place. And he proceeded to fly off over the terrain to a different area that he found was a bit clearer with a better chance of a safe landing. 60 seconds was a call from the ground control that says, I'm watching your fuel gauge and you have one minute of fuel left. Later you heard 30 seconds, so you can imagine. The feelings in Houston were, guys, you're flying on fumes, we recommend an abort. Actually, NASA never called that, and Mr. Armstrong could have ignored it if we had, probably would have, because he said, no, I can do it. Post-mission, we analyzed the fuel and found that he probably had around 21 seconds of fuel left in the tank when they actually touched down on the lunar surface. So he cut it pretty close. Mission rules were changed following that. <laughs> Okay, here we are on the moon. A couple of real problems with this photograph, though. As you can see, we have an astronaut here. This happens to be Aldrin uh, getting ready to salute the flag. And of course, they had a big windstorm on the moon that day. You can see it rippling in the breeze. 
no, no, no. It's a vacuum on the moon. So we stole an idea from Hollywood and took some really small wire and just wove that through the fabric of the flag <laughs> so that uh, glory was certainly blowing in the breeze. Secondly, it is really close to the lander. And as a result, when they lift it off to come back up and meet up with Mr. Collins, it knocked the flag down on the ground or on the lunar surface. So new mission rules said, you guys are going to have to walk a little further away or our flags are going to all end up on the ground. A couple of photographs here. You can see Buzz descending. It's about 10 feet down from the hatch, down the surface, but under 1.6 G, a really easy transit. Uh, Neil here is standing in the upper photograph uh, near the lander, right at the base of it. Uh, Buzz's boot print in the lunar soil is still there today, pristine, because there's really nothing to disturb it. Here you see a picture of Mr. Collins has been patiently waiting for these two journeyers to come back home. So he takes a picture of the lunar module as it's coming up to dock and them to transfer back with him. Here you can see President Nixon at the time has flown out to the aircraft carrier and is greeting the returning astronauts. NASA shared no expense, spared no expense. We put them up in really nice accommodations on the deck of the aircraft carrier in a Gulf Stream trailer and <laughs> kept them there for the next four weeks in quarantine. The medical folks had surmised that there might be some really bad bugs or something they're bringing back from the moon for the first three landing missions. We quarantined the crew. Uh, fortunately, after that, it was no longer necessary, so they were able to live a little more normal life. Uh, following Apollo uh, 11, we'll go to Apollo 12. Again, a very successful mission. Uh, here you can see unfurling the flag again in the windstorm. And in the lower right, we had uh, fashioned some really fancy suitcases for them to bring back rock boxes or samples. It's called a rock collection container. One of the features of that was that we took tiny screws with an insert that melted at different temperatures. It's just a quick and easy way for the scientists to know how hot those samples had been exposed to during the mission. I was fortunate on Apollo 12 that the crew presented me with one of the actual screws from their rock box on this particular mission. And I'd like to pass it around if you want to take it out and hold it for a moment. You're actually seeing something that was on the moon for a period of about four hours during this mission. Now, no one leaves until I can confirm that it <laughs> OK, again, a couple of uh, ground photos there. Uh, here you can see uh, the effect of 1.6G with the astronauts jumping up very easily as he's preparing to salute the flag. Apollo 13, well, a challenging mission. Probably the most successful failure NASA had. Uh, we're two days into the mission, uh, about one day away from uh, planned <coughs> landing. Uh, most of the, those of us that worked the missions, I happened to be on an off shift and had gone home, five minute commute right outside the Space Center. We all got phone calls that said, pack your bags and come back to the center right now. Because we'd had a call from the crew that said, Houston, we have a problem. That's probably an understatement. One of the oxygen tanks on the service module, which is that large propulsion vehicle just behind the command module, had exploded. As a result, instantaneously, the crew lost a huge supply of oxygen, which we needed both for breathing for the astronauts, uh, to prepare water in the fuel cell, and most importantly, to generate electrical power. So we're now essentially running on some reserves that are available within the command module. Gene Krantz, the flight director at the time, calls all of us together and says, we must get the crew back success safely. If you'll remember, they're about two days out. The best return is to allow them to go ahead and fly to the moon, immediately circle around it, and then come back to Earth. But that's a four-day mission, something we certainly had never really planned for. 
However, the great idea was, hey, we've got this lunar module, this little uh, life raft that's strapped onto the vehicle. What we could do is have the crew go ahead and uh, crawl through the tunnel into that, shut the door, and we'll treat that like our lifeboat. So hopefully that we can sustain the crew and get them back. Well, remember the lifeboat was only designed for two people, two astronauts to go down to the surface and only for a period of two days. We have three astronauts that need to make it for four days. So imagine the consumables were extremely tight. We probably had enough oxygen in the tanks of the lunar module without too much trouble. Water was an extremely short supply. And most importantly, almost no electrical power available to us, just some batteries that we had in the lunar module. So not able to operate heaters, fans, any sort of equipment like that. It was an extremely difficult return. Most of us never returned home during the entire mission. They set up cots and we all lived at the center of our various subsystems to ensure that we had some capability of returning them safely. Uh, during the mission, uh, the carbon dioxide began to build up inside the cabin. Uh, we had to call up special instructions on how they might put together a system to absorb that. So you can see a couple of the crew members here with duct tape, busy putting things, literally duct tape, uh, putting things together to survive, but it was successful. And finally, here they are splashed down the Pacific Ocean, very successful mission. Um, one of the crew members did suffer from a severe UTI infection because they had no water to drink. And it took about a week for that to clear up once they landed, but uh, they got back very dehydrated. The temperature in the command module during splashdown was 38 degrees Fahrenheit, so it got quite, quite cold. Well, Apollo 14 was a much bigger success. Here we'd given these guys a little garden cart that they could pull around so they could bring back even more rocks. In the course of the entire Apollo program, we returned about 600 pounds of lunar material, much of which is, which is still low, uh, stored at the Lunar Receiving Lab in Houston and is being examined over a period of time by scientists all over the world. I'm sorry I don't have any moon rocks to pass around today. NASA also began to deploy something called ALSEP, which was a scientific package that the astronauts would leave on the moon to determine all sorts of physical parameters and the environment in space. A couple more pictures from Apollo 14. They also, at this point, had a uh, little electric golf cart, the lunar roving vehicle, we termed it. I'll show you a picture a little bit later of uh, Captain Young driving around on the lunar surface. The important thing on Apollo 15 is the landing site choice. We're really getting ambitious now. You can see the terrain where we're planning to go is not a nice, flat, smooth plane, but something really dicey. You can see in the background some mountains, well, really, really tall hills on the moon. Uh, Dave Scott is the commander on that particular mission. Notice the flag is appropriately a little further away from the lander. Again, a couple of views just in the general area of where we landed. Apollo 16, the uh, next to the last mission, we have John Young, a Navy captain. He's going to drive the lunar rover around. There's no audio, but you get a sense of how much fun he's having. The uh, speed limit uh, probably should have been shorter for him. We always, he was a really risky guy. And we were always worried that he might attempt to go down in one of the craters and get stuck. The top speed on this golf cart was about 11 miles an hour going downhill. He's doing about six miles an hour here. Apollo 17, this was our geolo geology mission. Uh, we carried Harrison Schmidt, a PhD in geologist, who ventured quite some long distance away and did not adhere to our timelines because he was so excited about seeing up there and realizing since this is the last lunar landing mission planned that this would be the final opportunity for quite some time for them to get, gather material and bring it back for analysis. This is the one my I high school kids really enjoy. Pulling on the moon one day. <laughs> in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May. When the 
am much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. Doop, 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 doop. Oh, this is a neat way to travel. Isn't it great? all part of their work day. So that really concludes my prepared remarks today. Uh, hopefully uh, some of you may have some questions that I'll attempt to answer. And uh, also I've placed quite a few things over here on the table that you might be interested in going by to just glance at a bunch of photographs, far more than I could show here. I probably should digress for a moment and point out one of the easy ways to uh, pick us nerdy guys out in Houston at the Space Center was our hand calculator, which fortunately did not require batteries. So this is my actual slide rule. Um, <laughs> sadly, they don't. That's right. This was the best, though. This is a post uh, log log. And the government, in all its wisdom, surmised that we would need one in our pocket as well as wearing one on our belt loop. So they came up with a little circular slide rule. But I can only read this to about four decimal places. <laughs> so again, any questions that I might respond to? Yes? On the lunar module, did the, did the unit have separated gas tanks? Yes, it did. Yes. So 21 seconds left. Didn't that was for the landing motor. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little, tell us a little bit about like your background and how you got to work at NASA? I happened to be in the right place at the right time, literally. <laughs> a friend of mine from high school had gone to work for NASA a year before I was in, excuse me, in grad school at Boulder. And he oh. called and said, come down and visit. You should check this place out. I went down there. I got pretty excited, of course. Didn't really have strong career plans one way or the other, and I just foolishly sent in an application. Two weeks later, NASA called and said, would you be interested in coming to work for us? So I interrupted my studies at CU Boulder and joined NASA in 1965, um, but literally just in the right place at the right time. So if you went to CU Boulder, did you grow up in Colorado? No, no, I'm a Louisiana native. Okay. Uh, did my undergraduate work at LSU at uh, Louisiana, and then later transferred to, to Boulder for graduate study and interrupted that to go work for a fantastic agency. We were a tiny agency at the time, brand new agency. So the beauty is there was no government bureaucracy. I think uh, to travel anywhere in the world, my travel orders required like three signatures. When I left the agency 24 years later, there were 11 signatures on a set of travel orders. So. Typical of our government, I suppose. <laughs> Other question? Yes. Yes, ma'am. What did you do specifically? I was, um, I headed a group called Pyros, literally explosive devices. Uh, most people don't appreciate, but the spacecraft is covered with explosive devices. On a typical Apollo landing, we had over 300 events. Uh, pyros were chosen be for a number of reasons. One, they're very small, typically. Number two, they're extremely reliable for a lot of reasons that I could go into. They don't weigh a lot. Those are all important criteria. Most importantly, they function very quickly. And most of the events that we're carrying out have very, very precise timing requirements. You can imagine when we separate the lander from the upper stage on the lunar surface, a lot of things have to happen in this dance sequence. Uh, first, I have guillotines that cut fuel lines, other guillotines that cut electrical cables between the two stages. And for the electrical ones, we have another explosive device that electrically separates so that we don't get a short when we cut the wiring. All of that has to happen before we open the pressurization gauge to pressurize the tank and start the engine. They're just a huge variety of events that occur. and. A large majority of them are driven explosively. Also, the astronauts are always uniquely interested in the explosives. I spent a lot of time with the astronauts explaining why it wouldn't blow up too soon and it would blow up when it was required to. They were all very interested in that personally. <laughs> Another question. Yes. You ever meet the lady at Hidden Figures? 
I did watch the movie. I did not see the ladies. They were stationed at Langley, which was a relatively small NASA center. Uh, while it was a very nicely done movie, it did have a bit of Hollywood in it. Uh, they did refer to the Mission Control Center there. Unfortunately, that, that never really existed. There was a Launch Control Center in Florida, and Mission Control was all located in Houston. But very accomplished uh, ladies, no question. Yes? If you're talking about movies, what was your opinion of uh, Tom Hanks' as Apollo 13? Apollo 13 is incredibly correct. Yes, there are very, very few errors in it. A couple of things that really wouldn't matter to anyone. They did deploy the lunar legs on the lander. We literally didn't do that, but that's minor. No, the, the movie is quite authentic, and I highly recommend it. Yes? How did they aim their, their command module to get it to the place where it needs to be? <laughs> how, how, and, 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 and have it skip off into space? Uh, guidance and navigation was certainly an important subsystem. Uh, typically, uh, we aligned an IMU, an inertial measuring unit, actually two of them for redundancy in the spacecraft, and that tracked the vehicle's position in space throughout the entire mission. But periodically, we gave it electronic updates that were based on star sightings that one of the crew members had been trained to do. Unfortunately, for Apollo 13, there was a huge cloud of debris resulting from the explosion that obscured most of the stars, and it made realignment extremely difficult. Uh, frankly, NASA finally said, look, just focus on the, on the sun. You know, that's the best star you can see. Uh, actually, their navigation was incredibly precise. That unit, uh, that whole technology was developed by MIT at the Draper Laboratory. I think they've gone off completely in the outer space. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, alignment was extremely important both for the lunar transit and most importantly for the actual landing here on Earth. Pretty close, too. Yes. They actually, Apollo 13 landed about uh, three miles from the aircraft carrier. Yeah. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the interplay with the private industry during this uh, the, the private industry? Oh, extremely important. Uh, our um, NASA administrator at the time was James Webb of the James Webb Health Telescope. Incredibly astute politician. His, he came to Houston one time in the 24 years that I was there, and he said, guys, I'm a politician. I don't know anything about science. You guys do whatever you need to do. This has to be successful. My job is to make sure you have everything you need when you need it, and he went back to Washington. So probably the best administrator NASA ever had. <laughs> but his, his rule was very, very clear. He said, I insist that each one of the subsystems, mine was one of 29 subsystems on the vehicle, every subsystem must have sourced some part of this vehicle from every state in the United States. I want a piece of the vehicle in, from every state. Well, California, you know, that's pretty easy. New York, yeah. When we got to North Dakota, it was a real <laughs> challenge. No, no offense to anyone from North Dakota, but technology was perhaps not as evolved in that particular state. I had one experiment that the astronauts placed on the lunar surface uh, that had a very precision clock in it, a Bulova clock. And we directed Bulova on Long Island to get their jewels for the jewel bearings in the clock from an Indian reservation in North Dakota. The government had set up a watch bearing facility on this Indian reservation. So that was their contribution to my subsystem. But um, the interface with the contractors was critically important. The NASA contingent of what I was a part of was very small compared to the overall effort. Over 450,000 people in the United States were involved in some portion of the Apollo program. The vast, vast majority of those were private industry. Uh, we worked very, very closely with Martin Marietta, with um, Atomics International, uh, General Dynamics, uh, North American Aviation, of course, was prime contractor on Apollo, Grumman, all of these principal uh, major 
subcontractors who also had their own subcontractors. So the mission could not have succeeded without the support of American industry at the time. Other questions? Yes? Did you ever finish grad school? I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. When it was too late to be of any benefit. <laughs> Actually, the pyro area is a unique one in that you get on-the-job training. I'm happy to show that I still have all 10 fingers, which is important for someone that worked in explosives. But uh, very little was known about how to employ explosives in space, so it was a lot of development work. No textbooks, unfortunately. Other questions? Yes? How many patents were filed in the course of events there from uh, Mercury all the way through uh, Apollo 13? Well, I have five, personally. Um, <clears throat> Tens of thousands, literally. NASA Public Affairs, of course, really pushed that hard. They came around about every two years and said, get busy, find something else that we can patent. Disposable diapers was a direct result of the space program. Your smartphone that you have, direct outflow of the space program. I mean, just unbelievable, like MRIs today direct result of the space program. Yes? What do you think of the Mars program going to Mars? Challenging. Yes. Yeah, I would emphasize uh, our industry has transitioned so much from when I was there 50 years ago. Uh, then it was a government endeavor. And our priority was safety for the crew. I mean, that was the overriding concern always. Uh, there was no monetary, not real monetary concern or consideration. Today, of course, uh, space development activity has transitioned very much from the government now over to private industry. And you can see that with Mr. Branson and all of the other entrepreneurs. Uh, I worry about that because space is a very unforgiving environment. And the opportunity for something to go wrong is huge, and the opportunity to recover from that is virtually zero. And radiation. Radiation is certainly a real concern, but Mars mission, not in my lifetime. I doubt even for an unmanned, real unmanned reconnaissance in my lifetime. Yes? A return to the moon? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, our friends at Lockheed are actively involved in Orion. Uh, there is a launch planned in the not too distant future, not, not manned at this time, but nonetheless to develop the spacecraft itself. All of the spacecraft we developed back for Apollo, of course, are extinct now. Uh, pretty outmoded technologically, but I think the blueprints are probably lost by now. So there's a big effort underway on the part of private contractors to develop this return to the moon mission. But you may recall George Bush intended to do that. Mr. Obama uh, also planned to do that. Not sure that Mr. Trump said much about it, but uh, each president always grabs onto it, but it never quite catches on. That was a unique thing, I think, about the time that we did Apollo. Uh, our country was bitterly divided over the Vietnam War, but amazingly, there was just an entire swell of support for the government's endeavor in space so the country really came together like for the Apollo 11 mission and the Apollo 13 mission. And even after the Challenger accident, there was an in space shuttle, there was an opportunity for our citizens to band together and support what we were doing. But um, times have changed. Yes? Is, or do we consider Russia still, compete, as still competing with us or do they not no. have no, they, don't, they really don't have the capability anymore. For instance, we know that probably four, publicly, four cosmonauts were lost early on in the program. Of course, we've lost a number of astronauts uh, in the space shuttle program, and then earlier I alluded to with Apollo fire. Uh, they certainly do not have that capacity today. My pitch was titled Race to the Moon. It literally was a race. In 1968, the CIA and some other government agencies had informed NASA that Russia was getting ready to do a lunar mission. 
And that's what drove us pulling Apollo 8 back, the one that I spoke of earlier, the Christmas mission, to try to speed things up because we were concerned that Russia would literally get to the moon before us. Not land a cosmonaut, but still circle the moon, and that would be important. Uh, it was about that point in time that, NASA, that uh, Russia pretty much gave up the race, although they never announced it, of course. Yes? How close is China to uh, putting a settlement on the moon? Settlement on the moon, I, I would think quite a few years away. They certainly have the capability to transit the moon now. They could do that. But landing, I'm not so confident of. I, I, don't, I don't know that much about the Chinese program, but they're, they're an ambitious nation. They're in a far better position than Russia would be today to do that. Other questions? Folks, uh, yes. Oh, I just want no. to know how you, how you landed right here in Parker. <laughs> <laughs> you your life story. I know. <laughs> Well, I left NASA after 24 years, took a job as an engineering manager for an aerospace, small aerospace company that did military ordnance uh, east of Aurora. Then transitioned over to a high-speed automation company located initially in, in Aurora and still here in Denver. That, and I always brought my family up when I worked for NASA for summer vacations in the mountains to get away from the Houston humidity and heat. So we thought it'd be neat to live here and raise the family here. Yes? Did the UFO ever take an interest in what you all were doing? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't divulge that. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of pictures on the back side of the moon that look interesting. You might want to come up and see some of those. <laughs> Other questions? Folks, it has been my pleasure and honor I have so enjoyed my time with you and your enthusiastic attention. I really appreciate that. As I said, I put a number of artifacts, pictures, and things like that. You're welcome to come over and look. Most of the missions, the crew would give each of us that worked on the mission personally a patch, so you can see some really interesting, clever mission patches. But please feel free to go over there, and I'll be available if you have any questions you want to ask. Thanks again. Thanks.